Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers, welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. It's Tuesday. This kicks off a busy 10 plus weeks with Chad's opening starting tomorrow, 830 Mountain Time, 1030 Eastern. Come join me on YouTube. I'll be live streaming the trial every day. We'll be chatting, and at lunchtime, I'll be doing some lives. Before we jump back in, if you're watching on YouTube, you know the drill. Don't forget to hit subscribe, like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell if you want notifications of when I post new content. Click that little bell icon. Music fact of the day. There was a huge poll taken among music listeners of what is the most depressing song. So let's talk about the top five. Nothing compares to you, Prince and Sinead O'Connor. Number four, I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. Number three, The Living Years by Mike and the Mechanics. Number two, Candle in the Wind by Elton John. And number one, Everybody Hurts by R.E.M. Today, I'm going to finish up this refresher on Chad Daybell since openings are tomorrow. Because I skipped a day earlier in the week, I've had to sort of thin out these last two episodes. We're going to hit the important stuff, but I have 60 plus episodes doing a deep dive called Connecting the Dots. Also, daily recaps are in a playlist on my YouTube channel from Lori's Trial. You're welcome to go back and kind of dive into those. There's descriptions that tell you what each episode's about. So for the sake of time, we could be here another month with me doing just a crash course, but we're going to get you through so you're ready for tomorrow. Yesterday, we talked a little bit about Tylee and the things that she liked. We've heard stories over the years about sweet little JJ from Kay and Larry Woodcock and people who knew and loved him. One of my favorite stories from Larry is the first night they had JJ home after he was released from NICU, JJ was just unsettled. And so Larry opened up his robe and put JJ right on his chest and he fell asleep. What did some of his teachers there in Arizona say about JJ? They talked to Arizona Central and said, you meet him and there's just nothing but love because he was such a loving little boy. He just brought so much joy for us here. I remember him being so excited to come here to school, running down the hall. He could not wait for class to meet teachers, play along with his friends. JJ loved it here. He loved being around his peers. The classroom was his home. JJ was one of those friends that he was going to do great things. We work with so many different types of children. JJ was just one of those you knew could possibly go back to a mainstream classroom that would play sports or go to dances, graduate, maybe get married. Then that was taken. His grandparents have shared stories over the years of how J.J. would play the drums on little buckets and he would line up his stuffed animals and make cheering sounds. J.J. defied so many odds from the day he was born as a teeny little preemie and fought the whole way. And so my heart goes out to everybody who knew and loved J.J. that has to relive all of this over again, but one step closer to closing out this judicial process there in Idaho. Let's do it. We're going to jump back in. One thing at trial they showed as far as after they found the kids' bodies, where Tylee's remains were found. Some of the photos were so graphic with her, they were only shown to the jury. But they did show a photo of a necklace that was found in the fire pit and a charm that was found near the fire pit where her remains were found. And then they show a photo of Tylee wearing that very same necklace. On September 14th, JJ is pictured at Bear World in Rexburg. It's actually a 40-second video that has Alex, Lori, and JJ in it. Lori texts Alex saying she's going to pick up JJ's medication, which she doesn't. And Alex mentions to Zulema in a text that Lori fell asleep with JJ. September 17th at 3.15 p.m., J.J. is recorded on a neighbor's ring cam playing outside with a neighbor's kid. When Kay Woodcock saw this video, it concerned her. J.J. was not acting like himself, and he seemed angry. Of course, that is probably a direct result of Lori not medicating her son. I've always had the theory in some way the reason she didn't medicate him is because she probably knew what he was like unmedicated. And I think that validated her crazy theories that JJ was possessed if he was acting like an unmedicated child with autism. After September 17th, investigators note that was the last time Lori mentions either of the kids in any remaining text messages with Zulema. She tells Zulema she's dropping JJ off that day so she can go to the temple. 
September 18th, Lori finds a babysitter on care.com and that babysitter comes to meet both Lori and JJ. The babysitter said Lori was welcoming and hugged her. Lori told the babysitter they had just moved from Arizona and that her husband had a heart attack and JJ didn't understand. She also said her daughter Tylee was living in Rexburg but was a student at BYU. She told the babysitter Tylee did not like to watch JJ unless she was paid, so that's why this girl was hired. She told her Tylee would occasionally come do laundry, have dinner, or visit. All lies because at this point, unfortunately, Tylee was deceased. On the same day, Chad obtains a burner phone. September 19th, the babysitter comes to watch JJ. Lori tells her she is waiting for her brother to come go with her to the Idaho Falls airport. She also mentions that if she were to be late, she could give JJ his medication right before bed because it works fast and it makes him tired. She also tells the babysitter she would give JJ his medication when he was extra tough just to have him go to bed early. The babysitter said while Lori was gone, JJ had a meltdown. And when Lori returns, Lori showed JJ what the babysitter said was an overwhelming amount of love. That same day, Melanie Gibb and her boyfriend, David Warwick, visit Lori in Rexburg and they stay until the 23rd and stay with her at the townhomes. Gibb said Lori never mentioned Tylee, only to say she was attending BYU. Gibb said shortly after her arrival, Lori said that JJ had turned into a zombie and pointed out behaviors that Lori said was odd, like him sitting still to watch TV. She said that JJ claimed he loved Satan and he had an increased vocabulary. She said all that was what Lori pointed out as evidence JJ was possessed. September 20th was JJ's last day at his school there in Idaho. September 22nd at 1046 a.m., this photo is taken of JJ sitting on a couch in red pajamas. It's actually a short video. This is the last known photo of JJ alive. The same day, there are some text messages between Lori and Alex that stick out to investigators. At 8.55 a.m., Lori texts Alex, Hey, bub, go to LDS.org and watch the new Book of Mormon video. So good. Looks like you will appear in episode two. P.S. Do you have eggs? Now, investigators point out eggs is the street name for either Valium or Xanax. Alex responds, I'm open. How about you? Lori says, me too. They're still in the bedroom, so not sure what their plan is, but they should be up soon. She's talking about Gib and her boyfriend, David. Alex says, okay, let me know. Do you want me to get eggs and bring them to you? And Lori responds almost two hours later, come on over. Let's meet Chad at Terrestrial Temple in 20 minutes. Alex says, okay. Lori asks Alex if he can meet them there. Then later, Lori says, should we take them to Bear World today? Are you still there? Later that day, Lori texts, are you coming home? An hour later, some question marks. Later on, Lori texts Alex, are you ever coming back? He responds, yes, just waiting on Carissa for a fresh ceiling. In an interview with East Idaho News, Melanie Gibb told Nate Eaton that Lori said J.J. was getting in the way of their mission and she needed to send J.J. to Kay and Larry in Louisiana. Gibb said when she left Rexburg, ultimately she thought that's where J.J. was going. Gibb said in her time there, Lori and Chad were affectionate. They were holding hands, hugging and kissing. Just a reminder, Tammy Daybell, very much alive and well at this point. Gibb said when she was there, J.J. would either be in the family room or outside. By the way, yesterday I reposted a video on YouTube of a live I did on July 30th of last year. I was in Rexburg for Lori sentencing. I made the drive from the townhomes to Chad Daybell's property just to show the distance. That's on my YouTube if you want to check that out. September 22nd, David Warwick, the boyfriend of Melanie Gibbs, said the night of the 22nd, they were doing a podcast in the kitchen. It was him, Melanie Gibb, and Lori. JJ was not there. His understanding was he was staying with Alex. Now, Gibbs said Alex brought JJ in during the middle of that podcast, which she estimated to be between 9 and midnight. JJ was asleep. He had his head on Alex's shoulder. David Warwick said that at first glance, he thought it was a very tender moment. Investigators were talking later on, February 3rd of 2020, about this day and said, I can tell you Lori and Alex had a strange relationship. Around the day JJ disappeared, Alex was shopping for a coat for Lori. Weird. September 23rd, sometime in the overnight hours is when we believe JJ was murdered. I 100% believe Lori had a physical hand in JJ's murder, as with Tylee. Later on at Lori's trial, it would be testified that after JJ's body was found, they did find a single hair of Lori's wrapped on some duct tape that was with JJ's body. 
Her defense argued they live together. This isn't uncommon, which, you know, is understandable. But at the same time, it was just more confirmation for me that I think Lori was there when JJ was murdered. The morning of September 23rd, so JJ at this point has already been killed, and Gib and David were leaving. Between 8 and 9 that morning, Lori told Gib and David that JJ was being a zombie. She said he was climbing on the shelves in the kitchen. He climbed on the upper cabinets near the ceiling and knocked a picture of Jesus off the refrigerator. David asked to see JJ, and Lori said he was so out of control she had Alex come and get him. The two of them leave at about 9.30 to go back to wherever they're going. Gib and David leave around 9.30 a.m. for good. 9.55, Alex's phone is pinged on Chad's property. He stays until 10.12. The pings have him on the northern edge of the property, right near that tree and pond where JJ's body would eventually be found. The next day, September 23rd, there is a picture taken of ammunition from a gun shop on Alex's phone. September 24th, Lori calls the Madison School District and unenrolls JJ. She tells JJ's school he's going to Louisiana with his grandparents and might not be home until after October. Also, the babysitter reaches out about watching JJ again. She tells this girl the same story. He's gone with his grandparents. September 25th, Alex's phone is pinged again on Chad's property between 10.05 and 10.22. At this point, it looks like Alex is in or around the house. The same day, Alex takes the Jeep to a window tinting shop and had the front windows tinted 20% and the rear 5%. This Jeep belonged to Charles Vallow, which in turn, he let Tylee drive. September 26th, Melanie flies from Mesa, Arizona to Idaho Falls. The same day, Alex activates a burner phone in Rexburg. That phone number was connected to his Gmail account. September 28th, Alex goes to the Unified Sportsman's Club. He is practicing target shooting. Sometime in late September, the neighbor's child that JJ played with came to the townhouse to see if JJ could play. Lori tells this kid JJ's gone to Louisiana to be with his grandparents. On October 1st, 6.52 a.m., the Jeep that was driven by Alex in the attempted murder is seen on I-40 driving towards the Phoenix metro area. And get this, the rear tire is missing. This is 26 hours and 30 minutes prior to the attempt on Brandon. I have a video on YouTube, by the way, that I did. I will link in the description here that shows the way Alex had to lay in that back seat and open that rear window to try and shoot at Brandon, why it wouldn't work to have that tire on there. So check it out. It gives a good visual. There's a visual of the cell towers that Alex pinged off of in Arizona the day before Brandon is shot at. There's an outgoing call at 7.31 p.m. and then some incoming calls. Also, on October 1st, Lori rents the storage locker in Rexburg. She stores a lot of really sentimental things that belong to JJ and Tylee, such as photo blankets. The unit cost about $53 a month, and it was a 10 by 10 unit. Investigators note in emails back and forth, Lori was searching for wedding dresses and other information online. This is prior to Tammy Daybell's murder. October 2nd, Brandon is shot at in Gilbert. Brandon had dropped his children off and went to the gym. And on his way back to his house, he sees the back window of a Jeep pop open and what he thinks to be a silencer come out of that back window. Then the shot rings out. He speeds away, tries to chase this Jeep, loses sight of it. 911 is called. You see a very visibly upset Brandon on that body cam footage explaining what happened. In the Gilbert document dump we got a couple of years ago, investigators talk about how after Charles's murder, Brandon was scared he was next. Also, Alex called Lori in the time frame of that shooting. Brandon had only been in this home for about a week and told officers he was in the process of getting divorced. Only a handful of friends and Melanie's knew, so how Alex came to know the address, especially before it's online. You do the math. The same day of the shooting, Lori and Chad are seen on surveillance at the storage unit at 2.25 p.m. Chad is seen pulling out that rear tire from the Jeep and rolls it into the storage unit. Lori and Chad are also seen putting the rear seat from the Jeep into that unit. As they are leaving, Chad gives her a little booty tap. They stay around seven minutes. The same day of the shooting, Lori, Chad, and Alex search for the shooting in Gilbert. The cookies from various local news sites were deleted from their devices. October 3rd, the Jeep returns to the Idaho Falls area at some point. 2-11, Lori and Alex visit that storage unit. They stay for four minutes. 
Alex gets the rear tire and the seat from the unit and puts it back into the car. Zulema sends Alex a text asking how he's doing, and Alex says, wow, nice, just waiting and laughing and singing. And then he asks if she's coming up soon. October 3rd, Melanie is interviewed by Gilbert PD about this attempt on Brandon. She brought her youngest child with her, a big red flag to the investigator. Melanie's never asked why she was being brought in. After the interview, the investigator says that his suspicions about her involvement had increased. As of now, and I don't think we'll see any additional charges in this case unless other things come to light, only Lori and Chad were criminally charged with anything having to do with the four murders. Alex died before he could be charged. I think with Melanie and Gibb and Zulema, there was just a lack of digital evidence there to charge them. Or if they could have charged them, the time they would have served was so minor in relation to the value their testimony would have in ultimately securing these convictions against Lori and Chad, who were the ringleaders. I think all of us feel more people should be in jail because of this, but unfortunately, that's not the way it's played out. On October 4th, Lori gets a text from an unknown person. It was deleted, but investigators recover it. The text said, I said it wrong. The LDS woman who is an expert in all the feast days of the Hebrews that the Lord sent me to find through a dream didn't tell me the bride had to be the first to be symbolically translated before the 144,000. She said that the marriage feast always represented to the Hebrews the first resurrection. And the Lord had told her by the Spirit it would be at Adam on Diamon, the place where it all began. The bride had to be the first one resurrected in the first resurrection before the rest of her people, the 144,000, could. Because she had to cleanse for her ancestors' sins and their ancestors' sins as feminine sacrifice in order for the church of the firstborn to be born. Investigators interpreted this message would suggest this is where Lori had to go to become translated to be able to fulfill the beliefs of the church of the firstborn. Ultimately, Lori would visit Adam on Diamond October 11th, 2019, two days after Tammy Daybell was shot at by Alex Cox, and we're getting to that here soon. On October 4th, Tammy Daybell visits her parents in Springville, Utah. Chad, of course, said he was told by Tammy's dead ancestors that she needed to go. Chad told Zulema Tammy would die on this trip in a car wreck, but when she didn't die, she became a zombie. Her sister, Samantha, said on Dateline when she learned Tammy was coming alone, that was odd to her. Also, the same day, October 4th, Chad and Lori text. Chad says, thank you for sending me that paragraph, beautiful Lily. I'm eager to see you soon. Trying to hasten her departure. I love you endlessly. There were lips, heart, and a fire emoji. The next day, October 5th, from Chad to Lori at 3.25 a.m. Hello, sweet angel. Big news about Tammy. Please let me know if you're awake and can talk. I love you with a heart and lips emoji. The short version is that she's been switched. Tammy is in limbo. A level three demonic entity named Viola is in her body. It happened about 10 p.m. and was done by Tammy's sister, who I always knew was a three dark, but it turns out she's a multiple creation. Viola has been attached for about a year to my niece. He goes on to say this is a 12-year-old. He says, I've connected with Tammy in limbo and she's very frustrated and upset. She wants Viola removed as soon as possible. Viola seems to be similar to Penelope. The personality differences from Tammy should be evident quickly. Please seek a confirmation on this, but I've now checked three times since I got home and get more affirmative answers each time. Not fully sure of the timing for removal, but once her actions verify the differences, I don't want to wait. Do you remember before Lori was starting to put that pressure on Chad to get rid of Tammy? essentially saying she was done with Chad and he could come back when things were different. During that last visit with her parents, Tammy's dad said she was healthy. She was dancing in the living room and talking about taking Zumba and clogging classes. October 8th, this is the day before Tammy was shot at. Chad only communicated with Alex on that burner phone. Chad's phone was pinged at the townhomes around 1.20 p.m. and stayed for about an hour. The same day, Lori, who doesn't like to be around when things go down, she takes an Allegiant flight from Idaho Falls to Phoenix at 9.58 a.m. and uses the name Lori Ryan. Alex searches for a Grindel 6.5 drop from 100 to 300 yards. Now, at Lori's trial, Prosecutor Lindsey Blake asked the witness 
If you're searching for a drop, you're trying to figure out how far you can shoot and still hit the target. And the witness verifies that's correct. The day of the attempt on Tammy, Alex obtains a burner phone and he also Google searches how to clean an AR-15. He travels from Sportsman's Warehouse, which is where he goes target practicing, to the vicinity of the Daybell residence. Now, Tammy is shot at by Alex in her driveway. She had just returned home from a church function. At Lori's trial, they released the 911 call made by Tammy herself. Let's take a listen to that now. October 9, 2019. 21 hours, 49 minutes, 20 seconds. Fremont County Sheriff's Office. Hi, I need to report something. Okay, go ahead. What's the address? Okay, um, it's 202 North, 1900 East. The corner with the blinking yellow light on Salem Highway. Is it a suspicious person? Yes. Okay, what was he wearing? He was all dressed in black and he had a mask on. And he's at the blinking light now is where you saw him? No, no, I'm, when I, he's gone now because um, I pulled up into our driveway and he, I'm getting stuff out of the back seat of my car and suddenly he was there and he had a paintball gun and he was, okay, okay. and like, he was going to shoot at me. And I kept asking him what he was doing so I could tell it was a paintball thing. And then he just kept doing it, so I yelled to my husband, and then he took off running around the back of my house. Okay, give me just one minute. Stay on the line with me. Okay. That was North 1900 East? Yes. Okay. Do you know what uh, direction he was going? Um... He just went, he went behind my house and it's so dark out here and I just went in the house and got my husband and son and then they went out and looked and he was long gone by then. So he was on the north side of my house is where he went to get away. Okay. He didn't say anything or he just kept at like he was holding the gun like he was, you know, had a rifle and just shooting at me. But nothing came out of the gun either, so I don't think it was loaded. Okay, and what is your name? Is, my name is Tammy Daybell. Okay, I will pass your information on to my deputies. Um, we actually just had a previous call about this individual, so they're out in the area looking now. Okay, yeah, I think it was my son-in-law who lived diagonal from us that called you guys already. So. Oh, Okay, so I wanted to make sure it got reported. So, um, let's see. And what's your son-in-law's name? Joseph Murray. Okay, yep, it was him. Okay. So, all right, I have a deputy that will be out at your home here shortly. Okay, thank you. Yep. To me, it's very haunting to hear that because we know it was Alex Cox intending to murder Tammy and not somebody with a paintball gun. And also, 10 days from this very day, Tammy would be murdered. Lori only had conspiracy to commit murder for Tammy. Chad has murder charges. Tammy also made a post on Facebook about this incident saying, Okay, neighbors, something really weird just happened and I want you to know so you can watch out. I got home and parked in front of our driveway. As I was getting stuff out of the back seat, a guy wearing a ski mask was suddenly standing by the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad and he ran off around the back of my house. I have no idea what his motive was and he never spoke even after I asked him several times what he thought he was doing. I was about to smack him with my freezer mills from enrichment tonight when I decided to yell for Chad instead. Tammy's sister Samantha said on Dateline that Tammy kind of went after Alex after he tried to shoot her. In an email chain from investigators later on, they place Alex and Chad's phone in Rexburg around the time of the attempt on Tammy's life. At this point, Lori is staying with Melanie's in Arizona. At 11.11 11 p.m., Alex texts Zulema and they talk on the phone for 38 minutes, which investigators say is out of the ordinary for them since they typically didn't communicate late at night. October 10th, Lori goes to Missouri. Between October 11th and 12th, investigators find photos of Lori and friends in Adam on Diamond, that site in Missouri we just talked about. What is Adam on Diamond? This is where LDS teachings say Adam and Eve lived after being cast out of the Garden of Eden. It teaches that the place will be a gathering spot for a meeting of the priesthood leadership. 
including prophets of all ages and other righteous people prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. October 13th, Kay emails Lori to see JJ and says they miss him. Lori tells Kay she is trying to get JJ settled in. The same day, Lori travels to Idaho using the name Lori Ryan. Brandon also meets with a private investigator named Rich Robertson. Brandon wanted him to locate Alex and the Jeep as well as Melanie's. He hadn't heard from her in two weeks at this point. The same day, Melanie's calls Brandon and says she's moving to Boise with or without their children. This was odd to Brandon because Melanie's would never want to be apart from her kids in the past. Brandon also calls an investigator in Gilbert who's working on his attempted murder and lets him know that Melanie says she's moving. He also points out she has a rental agreement until July of 2020 there in Gilbert. Lori texts her friend Audrey about the demon in Tammy saying, we got her out, but a new one got in. Any ideas you may have would be appreciated. October 15th, Brandon calls that investigator again and says he's retained legal counsel. Also, he learned he was still legally married to Melanie's, which meant they still have 50-50 custody. He worried she could still legally leave the state with the kids. He said he would not exchange the kids with her the next day as scheduled. October 16th, the next day, Melanie goes to try to get her kids from school and finds out Brandon didn't bring the kids to school that day. She actually goes to the Gilbert police station to report it, and then the investigator takes that opportunity to question her about her plans to move to Idaho. She told the investigator that it was unplanned and she wanted a fresh start. She said Brandon was manipulating and threatening to disrupt her relationship with Lori. Investigators note Melanie's has no proof of any threats or any manipulation. At some point around this time, Melanie's makes a post on Facebook asking for information leading to Brandon and her kids and offers a $10,000 reward. She asks for prayers and all that jazz. The same day, Brandon calls the investigator after he learns that Melanie's is still on his financial accounts despite her agreeing back in August to remove herself. Brandon ultimately transferred his money to a different financial institution. October 17th through the 24th, Lori and Melanie's traveled to Hawaii. October 18th, Lori texts her friend Audrey and says, not sure how long we'll be here until our work is done. They also find photos of Lori in Hawaii on her devices much later. The night of the 18th, Alex is in a church parking lot, which is about two and a half miles from the Daybell home. Overnight into the 19th, Tammy Daybell is murdered. Chad called 911 and said she died in her sleep. The coroner did not perform an autopsy. Chad said Tammy went to bed with a cough and didn't wake up. He refused an autopsy, so Tammy's body was sent directly to the funeral home. Now, in Idaho County, coroners decide if autopsies will be performed. The coroner, Brenda Dye, did not order one. A little later, we'll go through the results of the autopsy and also what was testified to at Lori's trial regarding Tammy's murder. But as you know, she was buried and was not exhumed until December 11th. There was a text to Lori that same morning from a contact named Nicole at 9.18 a.m. It says, I'm not sure if you heard, but Chad's wife died last night and there are crying emojis. Lori responds at 9.33 a.m. Oh my gosh, I did not hear that. I'm in Hawaii and it's 6 a.m. She puts two crying emojis. Do you know what happened? Nicole responds, yes, she awoke in the night coughing, threw up, collapsed, and passed away. Lori also gets a text from Gib. Her name in Lori's phone is Phoebe. Gib says, I heard what happened to Chad's wife. Oh my gosh. Lori responds, hello, what? Gib calls Lori and they talk for about 20 minutes and 45 seconds. After the phone call, Gib sends Lori a screenshot where Chad had posted that Tammy had died. The post said, I'm saddened to share that my beautiful, talented wife, Tammy, passed away early this morning in her sleep. It is a shock to all of us. She was so wonderful in every way. We're still working out the details, but we are planning to hold a viewing Monday evening in Springville, Utah, then hold the funeral and burial there on Tuesday. We will hold a memorial service in Rexburg on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Zulema gets in on the texting and at 315 texts Lori, oh my goodness, did you know that was going to happen? How are you? How are you feeling? Maybe it was you that I saw at the temple getting ready to get married just yesterday and the girl was tiny like you. Lori responds, funny. I love you. Zulema tells Lori, ascended couples. Jules saw them coming soon. Nothing more powerful, she said. I love you too. Lori responds, that's good news. 
at the same time Zulema is texting Lori. She texts Chad. Hi, Chad. I just saw your post. I hope you're okay. Yesterday at the temple, I had a vision that I was helping a bride get ready and helping her with her white dress. Then I see your post today. The Lord is wonderful. Chad responds at 10.14 p.m. hours later. Thank you, Zulema. I'm hanging in there. Our family has received overwhelming support. Yes, changes are underway. We have all felt Tammy nearby. She is very happy and already very busy. Zulema says her work is underway. I'm happy for her. I'm also excited for what's next. I'm praying for you and your family. Much love and comfort to all of you. I hope to see you soon. The same day, Tylee's friend texts her and says she misses her and has been thinking about her. The friend receives a text from Tylee's phone six days later on the 25th of October saying, Hi, miss you guys too. Love ya. Later on, a neighbor of the Daybells told investigators the bonfire pit in their yard was hardly ever used, but she noticed after Tammy's murder, there were more frequent bonfires. October 20th, there's a ticket from Phoenix to Idaho book. On October 20th, Chad calls a hotel, which I think was to book rooms for Tammy's funeral. October 21st, there's a viewing for Tammy Daybell. We learned on Dateline that her sister Samantha fixed her hair for the viewing. On October 22nd, Tammy Daybell is buried. Chad pays for four rooms at the Holiday Inn Express in Springville, Utah. At the funeral, Tammy's sister Samantha told Dateline that she felt like Chad was avoiding her. Also, on the 22nd, the divorce between Melanie's and Brandon is finalized, but she is still the beneficiary on his life insurance policy. He contacts investigators on his case to let them know that Tammy Daybell was dead. Brandon was doing his research. October 23rd, a memorial service is held for Tammy in Rexburg. Now, just days later, there's surveillance on Lori and Chad. The detective noted they were seen holding hands and they note it was only days after Tammy Daybell was murdered. On October 23rd, 2019, Lori texts Chad that she had a bad dream about her brother, Alex. She says make sure he is still him and protect him. He would be the one they use to get us both. All this alone time is not good for him. Chad texts back a little later, I just cleared all of Al's weapons, curses, and cords Filled him with Malachite healing bomb, and I put angels around him. Also, on October 23rd, Chad texts Alex, Well done. Thy soul is cleansed. All is well. You will be a powerful servant. I bless you with the knowledge that you will now move forward with physical action and spiritual power that will be bestowed upon you. The same day, Lori travels from Phoenix to Idaho. October 27th, Kay emails Detective Moffitt, who is investigating Charles's murder in Arizona. Please contact me ASAP. We are hearing there are numerous things happening that have bearing on Charles's murder. The 28th, the next day, Kay emails Detective Moffitt and says, Chad Daybell, cult leader whom Charles suspected Lori was having an affair. Just so happened, his wife passed away in her sleep October 19th in Salem, Idaho. I'll send her obits shortly. How odd is that? I wonder if she was heavily insured. Lori had a large room at their home before she and Charles separated, which she used as a dance studio. She would record herself dancing two to three hours nightly and send videos to Daybell, which Charles discovered. Alex quit his job, whereabouts unknown. He must be hiding with Lori and JJ. Brandon was the one who Googled and found out Tammy was dead. Brandon gave Melanie's $300,000 for divorce settlement in recent past, just like before Lori moved and before they attempted his murder. Melanie's is obviously the new golden goose since they murdered Charles. They'll run through that money quickly. Also, Brandon discovered Melanie's stopped their divorce proceedings two days before they attempted to murder him. Something about she couldn't collect his life insurance if a divorce is pending. The same day, Alex sends Zulema a picture of Chad and Lori and two other women at a restaurant. Chad and Lori are sitting beside each other and Chad is no longer wearing his wedding band. Zulema responds to the text, he looks way too happy. Alex says he escaped the warden, so it's all downhill from here. Zulema says, he's a happy man, look at that smile. Alex says, he's a little giddy. Zulema responds, that's so cute. The same day, Alex and Chad go to the storage unit together. They brought bikes and other things to put in that unit. They stay around six minutes. The same day, Melanie signs the lease on her townhome up there in Idaho. October 29th, Lori tells the Madison School District JJ will be homeschooled. Also on the 29th, an investigator from Gilbert, Arizona, called the coroner, Brenda Dye, asking about Tammy Daybell. 
She tells the investigator no autopsy was performed, and the investigator put in his notes, despite her age and medical history. Brenda Dye asked if there was something suspicious surrounding Tammy's death. The investigator said he wasn't sure yet, but unsolicited, Brenda Dye shared she spoke with neighbors of the Daybell family. They referred to the Daybells as extremely religious, and there were recent reports of people meeting to plan for a doomsday event. October 30th, Melanie Gibb texts Lori, call me, it's important. Also, Brandon is still in hiding with his kids at this point. And on Halloween, October 31st, Melanie and Alex move her belongings from the home she shared with Brandon and their kids. She left a bunch of kids' items on the sidewalk. Private investigator Rich Robertson took photos of the U-Haul in the driveway as well as the discarded items there on the curb. He told Inside Edition it was all kid stuff. It was clothing, blankets, toys, mattresses, bedding materials. It was all in a pile out there on the curb with a little cardboard sign that said free. Now he places a tracking device on Melanie's and Alex's car and he follows into Rexburg. The same day, Detective Ray Hermosillo starts surveillance on Lori for Gilbert PD. Gilbert investigators contacted the Fremont County Sheriff's Office requesting their assistance in locating the Jeep used in that attempt on Brandon. November 1st, they had not seen Alex or the Jeep, so Detective Hermosillo obtained a search warrant to seize that Jeep when it was spotted. Lieutenant Powell from the Fremont County Sheriff's Office sees Lori and Chad holding hands while conducting surveillance. The same day, between 5 and 6 p.m., Melanie goes to the residence of a married couple who are friends of hers and Brandon's and stands in the driveway. Brandon had actually stayed with them briefly after the attempt on his life. The woman sees Melanie as she's trying to leave, so she gets out of her car and goes up to Melanie's, and Melanie tells her the Holy Spirit told her their kids were there at her residence and she was there to collect them. The woman tells her, your kids aren't here. She invites her into the home, and she also tells her husband, uh, Melanie's is here. When Melanie's came inside, she was asking for her kids and then repeated that the Holy Spirit told her where to find her kids. Melanie's tells the couple that Brandon was involved in dark things but didn't elaborate further. The couple kept telling Melanie's like, your kids aren't here. The man says Melanie's threatened them, saying something to the effect of if they knew what was good for them, they would tell her where her kids were. Eventually, Melanie leaves the house, but she sits in a white Kia SUV parked out front. She sat there for around 20 minutes, and the woman approached the car to talk to Melanie. Who does she see in the driver's seat? Alex. He doesn't acknowledge her at all, by the way. She told investigators she had never seen Melanie act this way, and it was really worrying to her. Ultimately, Alex and Melanie drive off, but they come back a short time later and stopped just a few homes down. From these people's house. Melanie's gets out of the car and stares at their house for a, a few minutes before getting back in the car and driving away. Y'all, I'd have freaked out. I'd have been throwing some holy water on her or something. But again, the car returned and parked for a bit and then drove away. The man said he was concerned for his family due to the way Melanie's was acting, but didn't contact police because they didn't want to get involved. Also, on this date, Lori and Chad fly from Salt Lake City to Kauai. They stay at the Kauai Beach Resort. On November 4th, Melanie's and Alex arrive in Rexburg. November 4th, Lori and Chad have a marriage license appointment. Police spot the Jeep in the parking lot of the townhomes, and it was impounded. The VIN number displayed on the dashboard was concealed, and one thing that stood out to investigators, nobody called to say, our Jeep is missing. We are going to end this one here. When we pick up, Lori and Chad get married, and it is a domino effect from here. At this point, the investigators are on to them. Not so much about J.J. and Tylee at this point, but things are starting to look suspicious between Charles and Tammy's murders and the attempt on Brandon. Hope you guys have a good rest of your afternoon. We'll see you soon.